being joined by a well-known guest world over and very controversial. Some of you have known him by that. His name is uh, King Joshua Maponga, who happens to be the Pan-Africanist of uh, this country as we get to find out how we can make Africa great. King, welcome to the program. Greetings. Greetings. I like your name, IP. You know, intellectual property, yeah. Uh, this supposed to be innocent Piri. Mm. But right on top of the program, the Piris in Zambia and the Piris in uh, Malawi are from the great tribe of the monkeys, right. who are the Shoko, mm. Mukanya Vudijena in Zimbabwe, mm. who are the Kabos in Botswana, the Twenes in Lesotho, mm. the Jambas uh, Lisa Lati in the Kosaland, Fakudze Mdolo in the Zululand and Swaziland, Skosana mm. in Kwandebele. So we're one big tribe of monkeys, and uh, from that note, I can tell you, I'm a Piri also. I'm a Nguye, I'm a Shoko, I'm a Mkanya. So, hello, my brother. <laughs> Thank you so much, King. I'm grateful to host you this evening. Blessings. blessings. Thank you so much. Yeah. Of course, uh, from the preamble you've just given on how Africa is all about, you've uh, you know, explained about so many languages, and uh, also breaking it down to my name as Piri, mm and what it means and where they are found. I'm grateful to have you this evening as a king from Zimbabwe. Let's begin to analyze or understand the continent we live in Africa as we look at its affairs in general. What is this continent we live in today called Africa? The, the state of drunkenness comes in three states. The first state of drunkenness is when you become all-knowing, where you know everything but by then your brains are not working correctly. Then if you drink some more, you become all-powerful, where you think you can do everything, you know, though you can hardly stand on one leg. Mm. The last state is when you become invisible. This is when you can help yourself to a bathroom on the middle of the road and you think no one is seeing you. It's an illusion of the mind. And the African continent right now is a recovering addict of colonial drunkenness where sometimes Africans pretend like they are all-knowing. So the most educated amongst us are the most stupid amongst us. Because in the midst of their knowledge... Did you say that? Yes, the most educated amongst us are the mm. most stupid amongst us. Because they know everything about the other, <laughs> except about themselves. They know exactly where William Shakespeare was born, where Bismarck lived, the wars of the Bolsheviks. They know they can quote poems and etc. They know everything about photosynthesis and what, but they know nothing about themselves, their own land, their own history, their own resources, and how to convert that knowledge into power, into technologies, into economy. <clears throat> so th th it's a recovering addiction from education, addiction from religion. Because had we been colonized by the Chinese right now, we would have been Buddhists and worshipping drug dragons. Those were captured by the Muslims are Muslims. We were captured by the British who say we are Christian. But point of correction, if we were captured by the Muslims, what would we have been right now? Look at the Boko Haram, look at the Biafra Kingdom in, 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 in Nigeria, look at, look at uh, Tanzania, look at Kenya, parts of Mozambique where Islam arrived early. So we understand that religious and religious kept capturing, religious colonialism, mm. comes with a political glove in it. So what type of Africa are we living in? We are living in an Africa that is economically intoxicated with colonial, neo-colonialism and all its fascists. We are living in an Africa that is politically constipated with constitutionalism of a barbaric nation. Right now, did you hear the elections in Britain where King Charles is going to become the king? Mm. How many people voted? Did you hear the ballot being cast out? So they are there, running their monarchs and their kingdoms in order. And they come here and they tell us, they, we, we, fair and free elections. Wh when are you going to have your free and fair elections? So they have their monarchical system. Because through the monarch system, you are able to have a custody of culture. Chinua Achebe, the center in Africa, is no longer holding. We are dealing with an Africa that is constipated with colonial medication and medical he issues how to heal, how to treat, etc. And Africans are excluded from that environment. Our own medicines are deemed as barbaric, as, as, as African traditional medicine. What's so traditional about African medicine? Is this not British traditional medicine? 
which part of which part are they missing here? The, both of them are traditional. Mm. So you're looking at economic slavery, political slavery, academic slavery, agricultural slavery. Look at your plate of food every evening, and you can see how much colonialism is in that plate. Look at your clothes. You can see the amount of colonialism that is in that space. Look at your entertainment. How much have we been colonized? Ultimately, when it comes to culture and spirituality, the Africa we live in right now, it is a nameless, nameless body of people who are migrating away from themselves into another culture. And the other culture is not migrating towards us to meet us halfway. Mm. The African is losing everything that he is because he thinks the utopia of success is embedded in the colonial message. Listen to me very carefully, young man. Mm. A man who abuses another man, a man who abuses a woman, does not have a right of telling that woman how to mourn, how to cry, and how to clean up her wounds. Just get out of my face. Allow me to be around the people that love me and let me recover from myself. But look at the confusion of Africans. The same system that abused us and took land away from us, here we are right now, busy worshipping and standing around. And these are the same people telling us how to cry. <laughs> Imagine I come and give you four, five, six clubs and you're crying. They tell, no, no, you don't cry like that. You don't cry like that. Mm. You know, you, you, I can help you to recover. Hell no! One of the problems that we are facing in Africa, of course, this has been agreed upon by all of us, that our economies are not doing well um, in the continent. And uh, we've been changing administrations, be it in Zimbabwe, where you come from, be it in Zambia, where you are this evening, be it uh, in South Africa, you can name all the countries. We've been changing administration to attend that economic emancipation. But up to now, it seems to be struggling. What could be the solution? What kind of a blueprint should we use for our African economic emancipation? You cannot talk about African economy without having means to the production lines that speak to that same economy. What am I talking about? Mm. The structure mm. through which the economy of Africa was set up by colonialists was to create a raw material harvesting economy from the African people. So that dig the materials, mm. take the agricultural project products, send them to your country, process those goods, and then bring, back, bring them back to Africa. Mm. So when you begin to talk about the economy of Africa, there's nothing called the economy of Africa. Until the Africans in Zambia, in Zimbabwe, have access to their mines, have access to their agricultural projects, products, have access to the manufacturing and processing industry, have access to the bank itself. We need a bank that is in the hands of Africans to sponsor African products, have access to the educational system to make sure that we teach our children right now in the copper belt. How can you graduate from a copper belt university and you still don't know what the usage of copper, how to mine it and how to process it and what products can come out of copper? Why is that Zambia is the largest producer of copper in the south, but you don't have one single industry that is producing copper cables in the whole of the southern region? Why are we shipping out raw material? Because as long as we are shipping out raw materials, we are shipping out jobs. So when you talk about the economy, you need to understand what we call value chains. You need to understand what we call production lines. Mm. Africans can not only be good at producing raw materials, and when the goods come back processed, the African cannot afford them. Then you say, why are Africans failing? Because they don't have access <laughs> mm. to the real nuggets, to the real, sorry for the language, they don't have, they don't have access to the, to, to the vault of power, which is to have money. And when you have money, you can buy the political system and influence the policies to be biased towards your own preferential procurement as an African nation. Therefore, you cannot say you have, you have an economy when you don't own the bank. You cannot say you have an economy when you don't own the insurance companies. You cannot say you have an economy when you don't own not only the universities, but owning the quality of information that those universities are teaching the children. So why are we talking about brain drain? When African children are educated by, like yourself, why are we running away from Africa? Because we think that our skills are better needed there. So education has not become a means to us as educated people solving African problems. Education has become a passport to run away from our own co communities. At the end of the day, even now, when you go back to your village, some of you guys are educated, even your own mothers don't know what to do with you now because you no longer eat this, you can no longer sleep there, you can no longer drink that. So please run to the shop, buy them him this, buy him that, and look around and say, are you here to become one of us or you have become a colonialist amongst us? 
One of the weapons we've been using to drive our economies in Africa has been the donor aid, or should I say, some forms of help from other, you know, superpower countries, you know, which are, who have been very merciful to our continent, to our countries in Africa, mm. to transform our economies. You can talk about, for example, uh, the IMF is one institution which has been very kind and very merciful to, uh, you know, the affairs of Africa mm. through the monies which uh, they give uh, us sometimes. Like kind, you know. You want to talk about the economic structural adjustment program in Zimbabwe, mm. ESAP, and you want to call that kind? You want to talk about the structural sanctions that have been going on in South Africa, Southern Africa, and call that kind? You want to call about the liberation struggles that Southern Africa has gone through to fight for democracy and call that kind? If democracy was the best way of governance, then why did we fight for it? Why didn't we give it for free? But in case you need more information, mm. I come to your house and I steal a golden bar at $100 and I take you to my house. Enjoy this one. Five years later, ten years later, the bar that I stole for a hundred dollars is now worth ten thousand dollars. All right. Then I organize three hundred dollars. Then I'm saying I'm donating it back to you. There is something called a sovereign fund in Indigenous bodies, mm. which is the profits of the raw material that were illegally taken away from Africa, but they've matured in price with the colonizer. Now they will borrow you your own money back as donor money. We don't all know but nothing. The law, if they believed in the law, if you steal something from me and its value appreciates way beyond the value that you stole it for or took it away from, you owe it to me on the sovereign fund to return at least to me some of the amount that you have stolen. Christians are out there. They read the Bible, but they read in a hurry. Zacchaeus says, if there is any, many, any man out there that I stole from, I will refund him four times the amount that I took from him. You know what that means? Mm. I stole your hundred dollars. Now it's worth ten thousand dollars. I'm willing to share with you four hundred dollars. I'll still remain with my six thousand four hundred and sixty dollars untouched, so to speak. Not even six thousand. I still, if I give you four hundred back, I remain with nine hundred and sixty. So even the amount that they're giving to us as donor money is a fraction of the total amount of wealth that was stolen from the African people. It's not donor money. We are being borrowed our own money against our own resources that were not paid properly. You call it stealing. Uh, King, you call it stealing because I think you are being unfair uh, if you are going to describe other races or other individuals as, 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 as stealing. You know, because you need to realize or you do know for a fact that we live in a global world, and therefore we need to ensure that we Young man, interact in, in my, together. In my old age, yeah. I cannot legitimize mm. the ripping of raw materials and using legal systems that are colonially instituted in Africa to protect the same multinational companies, and you call it a business transaction. There's no business transaction like that. That turns the copper belt into a dump site of copper. And yet the people in the copper belt are still working barefoot. And because the legislation framework allows them to take that mineral, then don't call it stealing. I call it stealing, sir. I call it stealing. Mm. Because you have no ethics and morality to deprive people of their own value, to deprive people of their own minerals, to deprive people of their own oil in Nigeria. That pipe runs through dilapidated villages, people barely making it living. Mm. But BP Shell is pulling out millions and gallons of oil away from Nigeria. And you don't call that stealing because the government has the law, and the law which is Roman Dutch. If we are running under a Roman Dutch law, then why not give us passports for Roman Dutch? Why not give us passports for America and, 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 and Deutschland? Mm. Because we are, and by the way, this is me in my own mischievous thinking. If you have a law that is called Roman Dutch, the first thing you need on law is what we call jurisdiction. Mm. So what is the jurisdiction of Roman Dutch? It must be Rome <laughs> and Deutschland. So how do you take a Roman Dutch law and bring it to Zambia, and then you sit in front of me here, and you want to legitimize a colonial system that entrenches a law so that they can steal. So hear me very well. Mm. The legal system is an official way of multinational companies stealing resources from their own people. You've given an example of uh, Koba Beot, uh, you know, which you've cited. Of course, not only Koba Beot here in Zambia. There are so many places where the same mineral resources you know, are said to be, uh, you know, in the hands of the uh, superpower uh, countries. 
But the truth is, King Maponga, you are aware that Africans or no any other country in Africa is capable to manage the mines because of we don't have the machinery to begin to process those minerals that we have today. That, that, Hence, the involvement of our friends, I call them friends, from the West, Europe, Let's call, them, let's call them frenemies. They're not friends. They are enemies who are pretending to be friends. Let's call them frenemies. That's a new word for you, huh? They're frenemies. They look like friends, but they're not friends. Now, this is where, when I'm talking, mm. you must hear me twice. When I'm saying we need to decolonize even education, that is the context I'm coming from. You, 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 you blatantly want to admit that we don't have the knowledge. We don't have the skills. We don't have the machinery. Like, really? Mm. Then what is the use of our universities? What is the use of our technical colleges? What is the use of the Department of Mining? What is the use of the Department of Commerce? Why not go out there like the Chinese did? Buy the damn mine. Rent out and hire the engineers. Bring them to your own colleges and teach your own young people how to use these machines. And you walk up to any of these mines around. How many white people are in there? Are there not black, black people working there? So at the end of the day, with a cankered, rotten system that doesn't want to look the devil in the eye and say the education which we are giving our children is not connected to the resources that they have on the ground. So even after they get educated, they still walk around and say, but we don't have capacity, we don't have the education, we don't have the skills. If you don't have the skills, then why did you go to school? Then what were you doing in school? Learning how many legs does the grasshopper have? Mm. Then you say, are educated? Then it means that the weakest link is not only the mining sector. The weakest link is the education and technical colleges that are producing engineers, electricians, who can't even go as Zambians. <laughs> And look at the copper belt as a source of resource. And say, how do we take our knowledge system and education in Zambia to look and study the copper industry properly and create that into a value chain so that we can employ our own children. Therefore, the curriculum at the University of Zambia is useless. <laughs> if it leaves the engineers and the mineralogists totally defunct of the fact of maximizing on the resources that are next door, right in front of their doors. And what is the answer to that, you No, know, those lamentations? Chase away the have. professors. Chase them away. What are they doing there? Would rather go and rent out some Chinese and British and German engineers and make them as lecturers who can show us how to create the same machinery that we're busy buying from the West. We need solutions, young men. We're not here to be lamenting problems. We need a solution. So if you're an engineering lecturer at a university and you have not produced the machinery that can deal with Zambian problems. You are wasting taxpayers' money. Fold those damn papers, put them in a cardboard box and take a leave of absence. You are a weakest link to the system. Useless, to say the least. Carrying a pile of books, yet you can't even run a, a, a spaza shop. Mm. King. <laughs> uh, uh, you know what? I will tell you one thing, huh? There's something that keeps on popping in my mind. And when I listen to people like you, I listen to people like uh, Pio Lumumba, I listen to also people like uh, individuals like uh, Julius uh, Malema, among others, other strong or controversial Pan-Africanists like you, you know, and the message I receive, message, I myself being a person who is, works in the media with the different uh, individuals, I receive different char characters on a daily basis. They say you, Pan-Africanist, people like you, for example, uh, King Maponga and others, you are just fond of lamenting. You are just fond of uh, talking. You are, in short, you are motivational speakers with no solutions whatsoever. When the face is beautiful mm. and the software is not working, hardware suffers. When a country is beautiful and the thinking of the country is not right, the resources of the country are always at stake. Our business, therefore, is to firstly to change mm. the software, the quality of thinking. I don't care what you call it. You can call it motivational speaking. You can call it wafflers and talkers with no solutions. But what solution can I give you when you can't think right? If right now I give you 10 million, 10 million US dollars, is it not true that in the next five, six days, your house will be full of things? Will you even think of opening and starting a business? No, because the African mind thinks that money is equivalent to expenses and buy it. So our job as forerunners right now, it is to rewire the thinking of the African children. That's not motivation as far as I'm concerned. If I want to do motivation, I'll be saying, I say I receive. 
Say I receive in Jesus mighty name. Then we say I'm motivating you to go and sit in front of a pastor and think that God can bless you when you don't have the means of land and resources. Mm -hmm. So this is not motivation. We are calling for a change of mindset. Change of government systems. We don't be changing foxes with hyenas here. Just changing leaders. But the system remains the same. Bureaucracy. Red taping. Bottlenecking. Policies that deliberately exclude the Africans from participating in the economy. Right now, if you are found holding a gold in your hand or holding diamonds in your hand, will you not be arrested? Why? Because the policy says you must have a license to hold it. Who writes the policy? It is the white man who wrote it. So that, what, so that black people cannot access the resources. So when was this written? Oh, it's the legislation of 1942. Were you in power, you UNDP or ZANU-PF or ANC? Were you there when this policy was approved? No, we just found it there. Then why are you sitting in a government office approving a policy which was deliberately designed to exclude you from your own people? You can't use African medicines. Why? Because there's a policy that was written in 1956. Hell no. Where were you in 1956 as a ruling party? So we need politicians that are mentally and politically circumcised to understand that they've now become custodians. Uncle Tom's. Who did not change the system? But we have moved into the same colonial chair. And they're now also responsible for giving directives and approving. Approving. Approving what? So that a black man can. So that a black man can. But you look very carefully at this policy. Government officials. Don't waste our time sitting in governments. Start looking at the monster in the house. That is evil legislative framework and policies economic policies political policies health policies education policies that deliberately exclude the black people from the mainstream economy and you call that motivation i say hell no this is not motivation time we're here for a grand revolution we need to shake the pillars of education shake the pillars of religion shake the pillars of the economy shake the pillars of the health systems shake the pillars of entertainment and says Africans, we cannot constantly be thinking that being slim and looking like a court hanger girl is what is beautiful. As you put in your advertisements, we have our women full of body with enough volumes to hold. Why must we wait for the white colonial way of expressing beauty? It's our way of expressing beauty. Now this cosmetic form of thinking multiplies itself over the entire plethora of African function. West when it comes to culture, where we uphold Western culture is superior to Western to African culture. Getting married in a white way, getting giving birth is not a sickness for crying out loud. Cows do it every day, but now they're making money out of it. And half our women, their stomachs are cut into half through cesarean section. What happened to our old ladies who knew how to help us deliver children with no vaccination and etc.? Have we lost that knowledge yet? Have we lost that knowledge yet? Oh, we have now become coconuts, brown on the outside, but white on the inside. King Maponga, let me now take you to the religion aspect. You know, Africans... You are not ready for religion. You are not ready for religion. May I finish my question? King? Uh, yeah, I'm saying, but you are not ready for religion. Because if I come on the religion, mm. this whole station is going to get on fire. <laughs> Permit me to finish my That's question. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, King. Yeah, let, let, let's talk about uh, the impact of uh, religion in Africa, or uh, more especially on the aspect of uh, the development that we're yearning all of us as Af uh, children of Africa. Africans have been, have been known to be people that are prayerful, people that are peaceful, and uh, of course that is supposed to be translated to nothing but development. Let me hear it from you as a Pan-Africanist, uh, how much positivity or how much dividends has religion in Africa added to the development of Africa? By the way, before you answer that question, King Maponga, I'm aware that you were expelled by the SDA church. What wrong did you commit? You're asking too many questions in one line. Let me start off here at the back here. Mm. You can never expel me because you never called me in the first place. I was never called by the church to do work for the church. Therefore, I don't wait for the church to expel me. And by the way, that was the rumor that was spread by the the war mongers and rumor mongers, I can educate you on the policies of the church. Right. You have a local church, you have a district, you have a conference, you have a union, you have a division, and you have the GC. All right? Mm. So the membership of any member is not held by the GC. It is held by the local church. All right? 
because even the leader of the GC, his membership is with the local church. Now, I speak Africanism. Mm. And a member who is one step away from the division, from the GC, which is the division, which was Honorable Dr. Nguaru himself, then writes a letter to the local conference and local churches worldwide that Maponga must not preach on our pulpits. You know what that means in terms of policy? Mm. It means that now the division, which has no jurisdiction over membership, is making a decision. You know what that means? It means that all the disciplinary issues of the local church have been, the powers have been taken away from the local church into the division, which was a breach of policy altogether. That's illegal and that's wrong. If you have a problem with me as a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Sir Nguaru Michael, step down, cool off. You have no power over me as a member. Talk to the union. Talk to, and the union will talk to the conference. The conference will talk to the district. <laughs> the district will call a business meeting at my local church. Let the local members that I worship in can now raise up their hands and say, Maponga, we have a problem with you. We are therefore excommunicating you from the local church. That whole process was not followed. So it was power muscling up. It was abuse of office of the highest order. And it's a shame that even the general conference and everybody else kept quiet when that happened. But it opens up a can of worms. It means that going forward, anyone in the system can be disciplined by someone who does not have authority to do it. So they put that one to rest. Sure. Let's talk about religion. Let's talk about religion. Mm -hmm. Religion. And its impact. The impact is positive. The impact is negative. Right. Because in as much as we had missionaries, we also had mercenaries that were looking like missionaries. Lots of development happened with religion, mm -hmm. building up of institutions, high schools, colleges. I remember in my own church, Rusangu, you know, and uh, you know, beautiful Riverside, and other projects that came through the church. But the only problem we have with religion is when it postpones activity and life in the now and pushes everything to heaven. When religion tells you, and some of these songs, some of you may know the songs, stop singing these stupid songs. Take the world, but give me Jesus. What are you going to do with Jesus if you don't have land? <laughs> and the white man has both the land and Jesus. And you're only happy to have Jesus. So when your religion makes you too much heavenly minded and of no earthly good, come on, I did preaching for 33 years. The black book says, occupy till I come. I've created you so that you might have dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and everything that is walking around here. And when you don't have dominion, then what kind of religion are you talking about? The impact of religion that has become a pacifier of African anger towards colonialism. What am I talking about? Because the Bible says, if a man claps you on one cheek, give him, give him the other. Mm. Is that verse only applicable to black people? That when a white man claps you, then give him the other cheek. When will the black man also have an opportunity of clapping the white man? And then we say, the Bible says, give us another cheek also. So we only become religious as long as the management of African anger is concerned mm. or the Bible must be across the board. So religion has become a pacifier. It manages black anger. Mm. We feel that. And we're still, religion has also confused us to think that if we fight and we struggle and we have misunderstanding with white people, we've quarreled with God because the white man looks like the savior. This is where the dangerous picture of Jesus that I've been fighting over a long time comes into space. People saying, you're being petty. Jesus says, no color. It's not, just shut up and listen. Mm. I'm not talking about color here. I'm talking about the psychological damage that a white Jesus, who now sits in your mind as your savior, when you look at a white man, what do you see immediately? Psychologically. We need to detox that and remove the lies of a whitewashed, and I mean white as of white as of colonial, a whitewashed religion that makes Africans always servants. They say when they read the Bible, servants obey your masters, slaves obey your masters. Mm. And only when a white man reads that verse, then it sounds nice. When will a black man read that verse and says, slaves obey your masters, and the black man is the Lord himself and the master? I want us to end, but of course we are going to close this program on the aspect of uh, the affairs of uh, Pan-Africanism. I know that there has been a lot of uh, leaders, uh, the Kwame Nkrumah, you can talk about the Modibo Keita, the Julius Kambara Ginyarede, the 
these are the individuals that sacrifice to have a one united continent called Africa. How do you look at the state of Pan-Africanism in Africa so far? Two answers I'll give you. Mm. Number one, it is that when Pan-Africanism seeks to mm. legitimize colonial constitutionalism, mm. then we are back in the same square. When Pan-Africanism upholds the teachings of Marxism and colonialism, capitalism, or it also to holding to socialism, we are just moving from one white man to another white man. So the change is very little. And some of our Pan-African move movements mm. are actually a calmest organization. So they are just basically complaining on capitalism, the white man, and moving us to, 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 to socialism, another white man. So the legitimacy of Pan-Africanism mm. is on Ubuntu. Are we going back to our indigenous ways of thinking? Indigenous governance, indigenous medicines, indigenous games and entertainment, indigenous healing processes, indigenous education system, the Shango bones, and etc. Indigenous technologies and entertainment. And until Pan-Africanism wants to say, how do we transform our thinking as Pan-Africanism, we fall in the same trap of neo-colonialism. Number two, Pan-Africanism towards the United States of Africa. I kind of hold that with a pinch of salt. Because talking about the state, you are still talking about the constitution. Yes, if you are going with the state, then you are still in the republic space. So I say, no, 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 let's, uh, let's become modern. Let's become individual states, but with one big state on top. Then you are actually aware you are being managed by the same devil. What I'm advocating for are the United Kingdoms of Africa. Where we went to war not to fight for democracy. We went to war to fight for land. So number one, give land back to its rightful owners. And I'm saying this very loudly. Mm. And I hope all the kings can hear me. Every man who is collecting rent in Lusaka is stealing the rent. Because none of you people in Lusaka here own this land. Except the king of this land. But the white men took the land from the black king. And the African governments walked into power and continued with district municipalities and city councils. City council in whose land? So when you begin to talk about Pan-Africanism, I hope you can hear. The scope is far much bigger. Yeah. Let's not use Pan-Africanism and use democracies to legitimize a theft area. Conclusion. Every African government is a crime scene. What do you mean there? It's a crime scene. Corruption is when two people are discussing property that doesn't belong to them. Hmm. I thought you were ending now. We can but start you bring the... other issues again. There are lots of issues to discuss. Yeah. There are lots of issues to discuss. Unfortunately. And until we can own our time as Africans to begin to know what we do with ourselves and our history. If we don't know where we are coming from as Africans, right. we never know where we are and we never know where we are going. King Joshua Maponga the third. Thank you so much for coming. I'm grateful. Sante san. Shukran. Ziko Mugambi. Pamene pamene ap. Dina apire ndi no chibwe no unwa. Tinga dunga chinya dunga chinya no unwa chonji. Mubu anjas. Ambu ya kudaise. Yeah. Thank you so much. I've uh, been hosting uh, Pan-Africanists from all the way from Zimbabwe. His name is uh, King Joshua Maponga the third coming to share with us a number of issues regards to how we can make Africa great. Thank you so much. You can follow the program on social media after the live feed. Of course, uh, tomorrow there will be a repeat of the same episode. Thank you so much. May God bless Zambia. May God bless Mother Africa. Good night. Thank you.
Nizona i BMW 650i ingangale yanu ngati mwapitiliza kupanga ma entries ya ma 5 kwacha. Mungateye new deal game shop time iliyonse kuseni muzuba mumazulo. Tamenya mufuni kakunkala nacho ni 6 kwacha mobile money account yanu. Then if you have that 6 kwacha, all you need to do is go to your keypad yuma dini za star 265 star 13275 star 5. Has send the more you enter, the more chances you have of becoming the owner of this beautiful BMW 650i Munjuanzi. Pasi waneo, nduna, ndura wa mkuru, nduna mangida, kutoka kwa mbati, wa mfuzi wa kidani. Lero halimbikani, mungo zi wa ufuzi. Lero mkala pa ufuzi. Kuyambila lero, mkala amfumu chikani. Zita, ya ulimbikani lero. Alimbikani. Na mbali kani chisote. Chisote cha ufumu. Cha ule melelo. Kuyambila lelo. Mki mwafumu. Ule mkale naimu. Alilele ni hibanya kutali lele. Hibanya kutali lele. Atidano mekela muzi. Ailele ni mbani ya kutali lele Mbani ya kutali lele Atidano mekela muzi Awela atidano wasu Atidano akawela Awela atidano wasu Amama na chesha kurila Awela atidano wasu Atidano akawela Awela atidano wasu Amama na chesha kurila Kote kako na mwe Nati pechi suti chitenge Eya, kulinga na nampamu zini pasiwa? Ali mbikani. Mbali kani nyula hii. Nyula ya ule mire. Nyula ya ufu. Ufu mwene wene. Kuyambila lelo? Nti mwafu. Ule mu? Kani na imu. Ali lele, ni vani ya kutali lele. Ivani akutali lele, atidano mekela muzi Alilele, Ivani akutali lele Ivani akutali lele, atidano mekela muzi Awela atidano wasu Atidano akawela, awela atidano wasu Mama, nate sakulila, awela atidano wasu Atidano akawela, awela atidano wasu Mama, nate sakulila Mafu mu osekelela mukatimamu tibi. Sosekelela kunja ya yule. 